Hi, I'm Reed Peterson, and welcome to Grief Refuge. Thanks for listening today and trusting Grief Refuge as a resource to help you navigate your grief and cope with your loss. If this is your first time listening, welcome. And if you've listened before, welcome back. Grief Refuge is about helping you find peace and purpose after experiencing a death-related loss. This podcast was created with the intention to help validate everything that you're going through, to take time to reflect, and to honor your loved one. Here at Grief Refuge, you will learn healthy ways to manage grief. You can also find comfort, hopefulness, and a sense of peace in regards to your loss, as well as finding a way to embrace life and move forward. Through the stories and conversations shared on this podcast, my intention is to help you work through the heavier, more painful feelings that go hand in hand with grief. Grief is hard, and it can be painful. I'm glad you're here, and I promise to do everything I can to provide the best support to you. Before we begin, I want to mention a couple important points. Because of the depth and the nature of this topic, it may be more beneficial to not multitask while listening. Rather, I invite you to use this time for your self-care and your personal reflection. Please use this time to settle in, to relax, and to allow your grief-related feelings to run their course. If anything, please use this time to mourn your loss. Also, this podcast publishes episodes twice a month, and when you're grieving, that's a lot of time in between each episode, and you may need more support, and you may need more resources. If you're in a place of needing more support, I strongly encourage you to download the Grief Refuge app. The Grief Refuge app helps provide comfort and support on a daily basis. On the Grief Refuge app, there are daily mini podcasts that help validate your grief. They give you perspective, and they help you sort through the thoughts and the feelings that come up when dealing with your loss and your grief. The Grief Refuge app is easy to find. It's a free download from your phone's app store. Please download it now to get started. Thank you, and let's move on to today's topic. Getting grief support can be a very difficult thing. You may find some available resources, but they can come with some strings attached. Often, people that are grieving feel like they have to be a certain way, or they'll be judged for what feels more authentic to them. It's kind of like a, my grief must fit in this box in order to feel accepted, and in order to experience a sense of healing. In order to heal and to reintegrate loss into your life and move forward, grievers need to authentically express their emotions regarding their loss. And that includes all of the pains, confusions, and uncertainties, just as much as all the hopes, gratitudes, and rationalization to quote-unquote move on. On today's Grief Refuge podcast, I have an authentic conversation with Marion Boyd, She's the co-author of a six-book series for Navigating Loss and Grief. With Marion, she shares her experiences and her earned wisdom regarding what it means to be a grief companion. Grief companioning is special because it's one of the few experiences that invites grievers to be their authentic selves. I hope you enjoy the conversation. It's a great discussion for how to develop a bond of trust when grieving and also with someone who is grieving. Hey everybody, I'm here with Marion, a friend of a friend, and today we're going to talk about many aspects of Marion's grief journey, Marion's grief story and experiences, and how she's really opened herself up to being, is it fair to call a grief educator? Marian? I think I'd rather be a grief companion. Grief companion. We're and going to as, talk about grief companionship. Yeah, uh, as you end up companioning, there's a lot of learning that goes on for sure. 
but it comes from the relationship of being a companion. Because awesome. I learned a lot. I learned so many from people that I'm supporting as well. So, mm -hmm. appreciate that distinction. This is going to be fun. Hey, Marianne, regarding grief companionship, um, we've both had some trainings with Dr. Ellen Wolfeld from mm -hmm. the Center for Loss and Life Transition. In my experience, when I think of being a grief companion, I put myself into a box of like one-to-one -one experiences. Mm -hmm. And so instead of bereavement or grief counseling, it's like, oh, grief companioning. Where's your take on what the grief companionship means? It was one of the first courses I took with Dr. Wolfeld. It was companioning the mourner. And um, it was an intuitive part, but it, it wasn't getting validated through my education experience. It wasn't, it wasn't seen as, I don't think it was seen as valid you, as a counselor. But I always felt like the one that was grieving needed to teach me about their grief. They needed to teach me about what their loss meant to them. They needed to teach me. They were the teacher. I remember I was um, I met up with a woman whose son had it was 14 and had taken his life. And she was in a really, really bad place, really bad place. And somebody suggested that I meet up with her and I thought, wow, I've, I've never lost a, a child to suicide. I, I, I don't know if she's going to see me as valid, right? Will, will she feel like I've got anything to offer her? So the first day we met, I just said, you know, I, Pam was her name, Pam. I've never lost a child to suicide. Will you teach me what it's like for you to be going through your grief? And she looked at me and she said, you were the only person that's ever asked me that question she'd been to counselors and psychiatrists and all kinds of folks and and I it, it's a humility it's like I don't come with, with uh, a sense to fix anybody but I come alongside to find out what's going on for you and let's find our way together and we found our way together Pam and I and it was one of the most remarkable journeys but it really started with that sense of I really don't know what this is like for you but I'm willing to come alongside you into the depths of the pits of horrific pain that you're experiencing and I won't leave you alone in that place to me that's a companion I mean it, I started a, an organization called Grief Walk in Guelph here in Ontario and one of the reasons that name came to my mind was the sense of that Psalm 23 that we all know, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are with me. And that sense of walking together, we're going to find our way, the steps may be really hard, the steps may be really full of thorns and and stones and the whole bit, but you know what, if we do this together, we'll find our way. And I truly believe in the process of grief, that grief and, and the mourning of a loss will lead to a place where someone will be able to find their feet again. And I truly have seen that happen over and over and over again. So to me, that's what, that's what being a companion is. And whether it's one-on-one -on -one or whether it's in a group, I've done group settings too where Oh, where people get to find out they're not alone in their grief. Somebody else felt the same as in we all learn from each other. And it is the most remarkable sacred experience, whether it's one-on-one -on -one or in a group or with a couple or whatever that situation happens to be. Um, that's what companioning looks like for me. It's a powerful description. It's really compelling. I guess... Um... Hmm. You know, when, you know what's interesting, Reed, just, oh, sorry, just, I just, something just struck me when you said that's powerful. It's like, when, when I took that session with uh, Dr. Wolfelt, it was like discovering one of the simplest things. I don't have to be a professional. I don't have to put a professional hat on. I, don't have, I just have to be literally a human to human 
person who's ready to walk through a valley with somebody. And to me, that took pressure off. It was powerful, but it was easy at the same time. And they, they sound opposite, but there was this release in me at being able to say, that's who I am. That's what I do. That's what this looks like. And it was suddenly doable and peer-to-peer -peer doable. You don't have to be a professional to do that. You just have to be a human being showing up to another human being. Sorry, I just thought of that when you said the word powerful. It's like, it is powerful. <laughs> it's powerful. <laughs> it's simplicity. Mm -hmm. I also hear the passion in your voice, and it's really... Uh inviting and it's it draws me in so thank you um by the way listeners we're recording this in the evening where marion lives so it's uh it's fun to know that she's got energy well into the evening because um companioning is so important in her life um, it's beautiful so a lot of people that are grieving i'm, I'm going to play griever's advocate for a second here <laughs> a lot of people that are grieving they definitely know that they need support and some of them reach out for support. And what I've learned at least through my, my experiences of grief companioning and doing grief education work is that a lot of people that are grieving, that are hurting, that are in pain, they're also looking for guidance. Mm -hmm. I've been really, really careful not to try to show up as their leader or their coach because I just know how unique their experience is. I just know that it's almost like what you described, like let's walk this journey together and then there will be discoveries made by you and you can teach me as your mm -hmm. companion because that teaching or that learning and that awareness is all contributing to your healing and I'm putting air quotes around healing. Mm -hmm. And so Marion, how do you respond when somebody not necessarily points the finger at you and says, I want guidance, but there's almost that energy charge to it where they're saying, Hey, you know, show me the way, show me the next step. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's early grief, isn't it? Can you please help me find a way to reduce this, this pain? this place that I'm in? Can we make it less? Can we make it more manageable? Can you give me hope? Can you give me hope? And I think um, sometimes I end up sharing a little bit of my own story um, as a way to say it's pers the personal parts, you know, that are, that have been able to go into the depths and what helped me. And then we talk about what helps some people isn't going to be helpful to others and what's going to be really important. I often say we're going to discover who you are as a grieving person. You may not know who that is before this day. You may not have ever met this person before. You as a griever, who are you? What do you need? What does that look like? And we just start to slow things down a little bit that way. Um, we just... And, and then I will listen for the things that, that work for them, that are important to them. Um, for instance, this gal Pam that I mentioned, what worked for her was I kept a piece of pad of paper beside me all the time. And then when she wrote down words, I would, I would, I would write her words down. I'd write them down. I'd, I'd capture them. And then we would start seeing links between her words. The two of us would discover it together. That really worked for Pam. Some people need um, to know what the end of the story looks like. You know how some people read the end of the book? And so some people need to see, well, what does it look like when I have been able to find my way through this, in this grief journey? What's, what's it going to look like? So we talk a bit about that, what it's been like for me or for some other people. Um, so it's, I think it's about slowing things down. It's about giving them the opportunity. They truly are the leader in their own grief journey. And I'm here to, um, maybe highlight things that, that start getting re repeated. Wow. You, you mentioned that last time we were together, but how would we talk about that a bit more? Is that something you'd like to talk more about? Seems like it's important. So, I mean, I'm listening for things that are, um, cues to what's going on. Can we find some new words for them to put their emotions, um, to their feelings? Our English language is so limited when it comes to emotion. 
Um, that's you know one of the things that we do with children is is give them color charts to help them understand the depth and the 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 strength of emotions. And that's what we did in our in our books. We use the color spectrum to talk about strength of emotion. So you, sometimes we use a word like sad. Well, is that like a, a red sad or is that like a, a green sad? And they're very different, but our language is so limited. So it's a different kind. We're in a very quick fix kind of society and grief invites us to do things very differently than that. So somebody, if they need a quick fix to, to kind of feel anchored, um, sometimes what I'll do is just kind of draw them what the dimensions of grief looks like, what that pattern might look like, and, and um, just to give them, okay, this is kind of where you are now, and this is where we're going to head, and we might be going off into here. And so sometimes that's been really helpful. It's so individual, but it's, it is literally trying to slow that space that's a, that breathing space to be able to listen to one's um, heart at that time. Mm -hmm. Marion, the idea for associating colors with different types of emotions and different aspects of grief experiences, that's new to me. And I'm so curious, like, where did the idea for that come from? Uh, my co-author, Marina Reed, and I both dabble in art. We love to paint. And when we were writing the first book, Loss of a Partner, uh, we were down in Costa Rica, hanging out in hammocks and going, how are we gonna show movement? Like we wanted to have a new, because you and I understand, and, and I, I'm sure a lot of your listeners have heard that Elizabeth Kubler-Ross developed the stages of grief. And that's been just, absorbed by society to try and explain the grief process for people. But Elizabeth Kubler-Ross never meant that to be for people who were grieving the loss of someone they, they she was looking at people in palliative care. And, and so, and that process, so how do we show movement in grief? Because movement gives hope. And how can we do that with reduced language and, and a, at a universal level? And, we both, I don't know, it was like Marina, my co-author, and I just started thinking about colors. And intuitively, we knew what the color red meant and what the color orange was. And when we started putting this together, we could begin to see that this could begin to become the, the, the framework for to show movement and grief. And so that's what you'll see in each of the books, the red section and red moments and then orange, yellow, those hot colors of that earlier place in our grief journey when those emotions feel hot. And then they, and as, as they start moving towards green and turquoise and pale blue, blue, they become a little bit softer, a little bit cooler. You can take sips of breath more in those places. So that's exactly where it came from. We just, as artists, we, we saw this and that these are universal understandings of these particular colors that were selected for the books. So. Yeah, and that, and so we're just inviting people to have a new way to talk about their grief right? and uh, give them more language, really. In my opinion, it's super creative. And it's in every book of the series? Every book. Every book. And there's how many books in the series? Six. Yeah, Six. our first one was Loss of a Partner because that was Marina's loss. And I knew that when she was ready to write, she is an author as well, that that, that would be our first book. And then we thought that was going to be it. And then we thought, uh, wait a second here. We went to a publisher and they went, they said, we want more. So then the next one we wrote was um, Loss of a Parent, because that was during COVID. And um, so many folks were losing their parents. So we wrote a Loss of a Parent book. And then we wrote, and then teens were really coming to us. Um, uh, Marina was a teacher as well. <laughs> she had a lot of hats on. Um, and these teens were coming, talking to her around the suicide death of friends or grandparents or people who had died or the losses they were experiencing. And they were saying, nobody will talk to us about our grief. They're all afraid of our grief. So they, we decided to write a book in conjunction with teens. So it's a book. It's called uh, Loss for Teens, and it's written exactly for teens. And then we wrote Loss of a Sibling or Friend. 
And we wrote Loss of a Pet, and then we wrote Loss of a Child. So that was our sixth book. Mm -hmm. Y'all have been busy. Yeah, COVID <laughs> shut a lot of other things down, so we kept busy and kept writing. And then we wrote four guidebooks to go with the books. <laughs> Marina's a machine. If I was on my own, I'd still be on book number one. But uh, it's good to have a partner that's <laughs> that's a machine. That, that is ambition. My yeah. goodness. <laughs> well, I mean, you and I know Dr. Wolfelt and the, <laughs> the number of books he puts out. So, yeah. Yeah, that's a lot of writing. <laughs> that's a lot of writing. But they all have the same template. We use the colors. And the, the red moments and orange moments are all in first person with a, a compassionate response. Uh, so they're all the same in, in their format, but obviously very different in, their, um, in what they're talking about in loss. You know, it's interesting. I, I make this projection that books are written for people to get guidance or get instruction Obviously, not every book is written for that intention, but in grief, like I said, I, I make this projection and I hold this assumption that they are. And so, so in the writing of the books with your co-author, you started first with what sounds like her personal story mm -hmm. to help get the writing process started. Mm -hmm. Did you find yourself companioning her? throughout the writing of that book? Oh, yeah. I had companioned her prior to that for seven years. Um, I met her randomly through a friend who was worried about her neighbor. So I went to her door and said, hey, if you ever want to talk. And then that led to um, her talking, mainly through email. And what was remarkable to me was how she put what she was feeling into words. That was like, it blew me away. So... I just always tucked it away in the back of my mind that if ever we came to write a book about her story, it would be a pretty remarkable story. We didn't really write a book about her story in the end. Uh, we felt like that was just too limited and too limiting to people who could relate to it. Um, but it was the jump off point. But it was it was definitely because she's the one that wrote the first person perspective of the griever. And then I wrote the response of a caring companion in, in each moment. And sometimes there's a dialogue. Sometimes it's just one, one response. And many a times it was triggering her back. And we, we would stop and, and I would we'd be companioning. Um, and then the same like loss of a parent. My dad is 95. And writing that book was really hard because I could just envision that becoming my story. And so she was companioning me through that one and then loss of a child through my own infertility experience um, that one was really resonating and we both have young adult children and so writing that book was a hard one to write again from the first person perspective of somebody actually going through it so definitely a lot of companioning back and forth for both of us it took uh we became really each other's anchor and support and companion through the whole process. Mm. It's easy for me to project onto how much of a bond the two mm -hmm. of you developed through this. Oh yeah. We had to develop quite a trust. It, and isn't companioning truly isn't trust at the core of becoming a companion. Somebody's trusting with you with their most heartbreaking life-changing moment and that is a trust that is remarkable and it happens very quickly um, sometimes and sometimes it takes a little while but somebody can usually pick up pretty quickly if you're there for them and you don't have a hidden agenda you're not there to fix or proselytize or any other reason you're there for them I love that reflection because I remember in getting trained and learning how to companion, I think I began thinking that the core uh, for me was about compassion. And then I was like, you know what? Compassion is there, but mm -hmm. it's not necessarily the essence or 
the the core mm -hmm. and then I, I really realized I was hearing people that I was companioning speak to um, just appreciating not being judged mm -hmm. and I was like okay so is it about judgment and not feeling judged and then you know pondered that for a while mm -hmm. and I think I arrived at a similar place to what you just described I, I realized it fundamentally is about trust mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and, and that bond of trust yes bond of trust so marina my co-author and i started with a bond of trust through her grief and then we carried that into our books and that bond deepened as we companioned each other supported each other and were creative together and but it we butt heads together <laughs> i mean it wasn't always you know love and light no we're not going to do that well what about me you know, I mean, we got i mean the trust allows you to say what needs to be said too right and, and so it was uh, it was a phenomenal process really okay. wow what a journey mm -hmm. so kind of random but we're on this topic of companionship and i just want to keep flowing with it in your opinion, how do books show up as companions to readers? I think some books will more than others, um, but I think it also depends on who the person is and what they need in their grief journey at that moment. Many people that I've met need to have a head knowledge right off the bat. They need to know what is grief? What does it look like? How do I get there? How do I move? Like they want the facts, give me the facts. And once I've got the structure and the facts, then, then I'll go into my grief. I've met, you know, some men are like that. Some women are like that. It's not a gender thing. It's just, I need the facts. So some people will want to read a book of, this is what grief is like. This is what the movement is. And this is what your experience. Okay, got it. Now I can grieve. Um, other folks, and I think a lot of people eventually want to know they're not alone in their grief. And so a book that can connect to what you're feeling and get out of the head and more into the heart and maybe put into words what you're what you can't quite find the words for and identify with with that book in, in I'm experiencing that or something that resonates and then. Um, I, I just can't help but go to how we framed our books because each moment, and there are like a hundred moments in the book, each moment is a grieving person sharing an experience, a moment that they're experiencing. And then there's a response from a companion. So, and then sometimes there's a dialogue. So a book that can give a sense of I'm being heard, I'm being understood, this feels safe. This feels like they know grief. This isn't just somebody talking about grief, but they know they've been there. I think that's really, really important. So we designed these books for people who are maybe isolated and they have nobody. Um, and the book literally becomes a companion. Um, that, that kind of picture was really important to us as we wrote the book because everybody needs a safe person. Um, I, I, I did a presentation with a bunch of psychiatrists once and, you know, I'm talking about peer to peer and I just asked them, what percentage of people do you think actually need to go to a, a, a professional therapist for grief? And without, without hesitation, the, the, the head psychiatrist said, at least 90% of people don't need to see a, a professional, but they need somebody safe and somebody with them on their journey. They need a person. And so effective grief work is done with someone else, a companion. And so I think books can be that. Um, and, you know, there's, there's a lot of good books out there. Um, obviously, Dr. Wolfelt's written so many of them. And we didn't, and these are a different way to approach it again. And so it's finding what works best for you. But I think books really can become a companion. We've invited people in our books also to, to create their own journal in the books. Like we give blank page suggestions. So it's turning into your story page after page after page, which is pretty cool as well. You know what I just thought of? Hmm. 
in your sharing of how you think books can companion others, I, I think for some people too, a book is a more trusted source mm -hmm. than you know, somebody in their family or somebody in their social network mm -hmm. because they may be lacking trust in others. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very much so. Yeah, good point. Back to the trust piece when it can't exist with other human beings right now, right? A book may be that very source of trust. Yeah. Mm -hmm. hmm. Lots to ponder. Yeah. Well, as far as grief companionship as a term, do you ever get strange looks from people when you say I'm available as a grief companion? Actually, I don't introduce myself that way <laughs> um, because I don't think a lot of people will understand what that is. Um, How do you introduce yourself? It depends on the setting, but uh, say I, I went to a neighbor and like I did to Marina and I said, um, I know you've been through one of the most horrific experiences and losses. And if you would like to talk, I'm here, I'm ready and I'm okay to talk. And um, I'd be honored to do that. So in my mind, I'm defining myself and what I'm doing as companioning. But if I'd gone up to her, I think that word actually probably would have turned her off. I think she might've thought companion, like, I, I, what, what's that like what is like no I, I'm not looking for a companion sounds like a caregiver right because mm -hmm. I don't think people really understand what the word means so I I would never introduce myself that way I'm introducing myself to you that way because I know you know the word um I don't really maybe I get there later and and say something like well we're we're kind of companioning together on this journey or something, but it's more what's going on in my mind rather than what's coming out to the person. Does that make sense? Like, because I think it could be misunderstood and, and um, not really helpful. To come it does around. make sense. And in my own experience, there is a hesitation to say I'm a grief companion. I, I do my best to make the distinction that I'm not here to provide any type of mental health support mm -hmm. and so then people quite bluntly say well what do you do then <laughs> well, yeah I think and people then, understand yeah sorry go ahead yeah oh and then you know I I have uh, my my elevator pitch about companioning and and that's when I I label it yeah. but it really does depend on whom I'm speaking to because there's maybe certain words. I like how you say people might put it in some kind of analogy or, or relatability to caregiving. And then they might have, they might have their defenses up and say, well, yeah. I don't, I don't need to be cared for right now. Or, you know, yeah, yeah. Yeah. puts them on the defensive and, yeah. and that, you know, like you said, with um, Marina, it, it could have been possible that she would have not been open to mm -hmm. you showing up as a companion. Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, use, I'll use the word support, grief support more, because I think people really understand what that is. But we need to understand ourselves what that support looks like. And for me, in, in my definition, the definition of support, good support, is, um, is companion. Mm. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Did you know the term existed before you met Ellen Wolfelt, as far as in the context of grief? N no, I wouldn't. I'd never used it in that context before at all. I mean, companion, like we have companion dogs, we have companion caregivers for senior citizens, we have companion, you know, I mean, there's a lot of other ways the word is used. Um, but as he defines it, and as he taught about it, and so on, I think that it, it, it was the only word that was really um, grasping what it, it needed to be coming alongside, not fixing, not, not prescribing, all of those kinds of things. So um, no, I'd, I'd never used it in relation, but when I heard the word and all the things that I was intuitively doing anyway, now I had a word for it. So that was actually, so many light bulbs were just going on in aha moments and, and uh, affirmation. 
So that was really a neat thing. That was in 2010. Mm, okay. Yeah. yeah. I mean, he's been doing this a long time, that, but that was my first training with him. Yeah. It feels good to get a lot of acknowledgement and reassurance for something that you've been intuiting for a long time, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Mm -hmm. mm. Well, Marian, I think that we're going to wrap up here. I've so appreciated just conversing and sharing mm -hmm. your perspective and also, you know, the, the contributions you've made to people that are grieving with the series of books. They sound extremely creative. I love the approach and how unique it is. And then you know, you're addressing a process that you and your co-authors see as a universal experience and mm -hmm. then helping the reader who is the griever kind of uh, take what they need from the resource available. So thank you for that contribution or those contributions, because I know you wrote <laughs> many books. <laughs> thank you. Mm -hmm. And I do hope to have you back. I know that we didn't even necessarily scratch the surface on some of your own personal story and your loss. From what I can tell, your story is powerful. And I think that we're going to have to have you back in order to share that. I would be delighted to uh, sit with you again and uh, chat. It was good. Thank you. You bet. Marianne, thanks so much for being a part of Grief Refuge. Absolutely. Thank you so much for listening to the full interview. I'm deeply grateful for your trust in Grief Refuge and all the stories and the experiences shared here on this podcast. Grief and healing is important work, and although painful at times, it's worth it for helping to heal your heart, mind, and soul. Remember that if you need more support, download the Grief Refuge app. It's a daily companion that is made to comfort and support you through this difficult journey. Please search for Grief Refuge on your phone's app store now. Also, it would be wonderful if you left a rating and review for this podcast. Your feedback, it's deeply valued and it's listened to. We want the Grief Refuge podcast to best serve your needs. And the more you let us know, the better we can provide. So please rate and review the Grief Refuge podcast on your favorite podcast player. Thank you. Take care. Keep honoring your grief. Keep listening to your heart. Please be kind to yourself and talk to you soon.